let's wait one, two minutes for the people to connect. Well, I think we can start. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Niki Siabaku, Joint Research Fellow with the ICCT and Acer Institute. And I'm very happy to welcome you today for a webinar on victims of terrorism and the right to access justice. Thank you very much for being here. And also a special thanks to all attendees who were conducted by the ICCT event and communication team to clarify which event they wanted to attend as they were as we had a minor issue with our website. So there was a mix between uh, the registration page of two events. Thank you very much for collaborating with our uh, event and communication team and finding a solution on this topic. So uh, before introducing our speakers today, I would like to briefly uh, introduce ICCT to those who are not uh, very familiar with our work. So ICCT is an independent think and do tank based in The Hague in the Netherlands, working to provide research, evidence-based policy advice, and practical on-the-ground solutions on matters regarding counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism with a special focus on prevention, rule of law, and respect of human rights. Among our topic of research, victims of terrorism is a priority area uh, for the ICCT, as uh, this is the people who have uh, who experience the consequences of the terrorist acts. Uh, these acts often entail a large number of victims with different kinds of harm, which can have a long-lasting impact on victims' lives. And among victims' needs after the commission of crimes linked to terrorism, access to justice uh, plays a really important role. However, as we're going to see today, many obstacles remain to be overcome, such as the inexistence of victims' participation provision in certain uh, legal systems, the lack of information to victims, the absence of legal aid, or maybe the or even the case of the cross-border victims. So questions such as how these obstacles can be resolved, how the experiences of uh, the victims can be best taken into consideration during the investigation and the trial process, and what uh, the victims' experience are with the judicial system will be answered today, among other uh, questions, by our distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, I think this is the moment to uh, introduce you to uh, our three uh, speakers for the today webinar. Uh, first of all, we will have uh, our first speaker, who is uh, Zan Sulzer. Uh, she is a founding partner of Impact Litigation Law Firm, representing victims of international crimes. She's, she has over 20 years of practical experience in the field of human rights, international criminal law, and counterterrorism, with an expertise in strategic litigation at both the national and international level, including before the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia. Uh, Jean has held the senior positions at, at major international human rights organizations, acting as director of law and policy at Amnesty International France, 
and Director of International Justice with the International Federation for Human Rights. As he has extensive experience in advocacy and training, including drafting of legislation and gender-based violence. Finally, he teaches international criminal law, strategic litigation, human rights, and prosecuting terrorism at Sciences Po in Paris uh, de Pantheon Assas. We are also very happy to have her uh, in the ICCT as an associate fellow within the pillar of rule of law and responses to terrorism. Uh, Zansi will give, she will give us today the point of view of a lawyer of victims of terrorism and explain to us the different obstacles that victims uh, encounter in their road to justice. Our second speaker today is Katrin uh, Marquis-Well, who is uh, the head of the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism for Syria, uh, which is known as IIIM. Uh, Katrin has been the first head of the mechanism since uh, 2017, and previously an ombudsperson for the Security Council Committee concerning ISIL, uh, Al-Qaeda, and associated individuals, groups, undertakings, and entities. Uh, previously, uh, Catherine was a judge in France, and she served in the same capacity with the International, uh, United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. Catherine was a senior legal officer and head of chambers at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and also held legal positions in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with United Nations peacekeeping missions in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Liberia. Our last speaker is uh, Hope Rickelman, who is the director of Yazidi Legal Network and head of the Iraq and Syria project at the Muhanovic Foundation. Uh, Hope uh, specialized in international and Dutch criminal law at the University of Amsterdam and the University of Zagreb. She has developed human rights programs for human rights activists and conduct uh, criminal investigation into international crimes with national jurisdiction with the aim of establishing individual liability before the Dutch courts. She focuses on access to justice and reparation for victims of international crimes, and within all her projects, her main aim is to support the community, give them a voice and make connection where needed. So today, Hope, she will give us the perspective of victims and how uh, victims of terrorism experience uh, their uh, experience uh, access to justice and the whole procedure before uh, the court. I would like to thank uh, our three speakers for having accepted the invitation and being with us today. And before giving the floor to our first speaker, I'll have to give you some uh, information to keep uh, the session running smoothly. Uh, so uh, there will be a short half hour Q&A session after the panelists' presentations. So if you uh, would like to ask any question, uh, please feel free to submit it at any time during the webinar using Zoom's Q&A feature that you can find on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible, but please excuse us if some are left unanswered because of time constraints. Uh, also, uh, I have to know that the record recording of the event uh, will be made available to all registered participants on the ICCT YouTube channel. And finally, please help us improve future events by completing the very short post-event survey that will pop, out, pop up on your screens uh, when you leave this webinar. So I hope that everything is clear and uh, having provided all this uh, practical information, I would like to thank you for being here for the last time and give the floor to Jeanne, who will, uh, will be the first speaker with her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. I don't know, depending on where you are. Um, I thank you so much for the invitation from ICCT. Um, I would like to be able to share my screen, so just give me a minute. I'm just gonna... Is it working? Yeah. So um, I I was asked to um, make a, a brief 
uh, presentation on, on uh, the legal framework with regards to victims of terrorism, the very, very recent and, and new legal framework on victims of terrorism. There is not a lot on, on that, but I will try. And then also to give some perspectives of the lessons learned from the judicial response with, um, in the last uh, three years to terrorist attacks uh, before French courts um, from a lawyer's perspective. Um, I just want to say that I was uh, representing um, 12 victims in the 14th of November 2015 uh, attacks, um, all foreigners from Chile and from Spain. And in the Greece, uh, 14th of July um, 2016 attacks, uh, representing two families um, of Italian victims. So for some reason, I specialize in cross-border victims, foreign victims of, of terrorist attacks in, in, Spain, in France. And I will touch on that um, a little bit later. So first, um, maybe just a few words about victims of, uh, of terrorism, uh, just to go back to the fundamentals quickly. Um, there, there is no, um, there is no universally agreed or convention that defines victims. That's the first thing to take into account. So the, the definition of victim that we use at the international level is one that is based on the, Uni the United Nations General Assembly in 1985 Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims. For victims of crime in general, that of course also applies to victims of terrorism. And that definition is one that has been then transferred into many, many other instruments, including the International Criminal Court Rule of Procedure and Evidence. Uh, so victims means anyone that has individually or, sur or collectively suffered harm, and that harm can be, can be material, can be psychological, and can be um, physical harm. And the, the definition of victim is not limited to the direct victim, but it also goes to extends to the uh, indirect victims, uh, a victim that could be the family members of a deceased person, but also persons that uh, may uh, come to assist or to support the direct victim. And that's very important in the context of victims of terrorism that we'll see later. Um, so, after the 1985, that definition has also been um, uh, taken again uh, and is important to, to find the basic uh, fundamental principles of the rights of victims in, in the 2005 UN basic principles on the right to remedy. Um, saying that, there is also a very important aspect, which is that once we have more or less a definition of who can be a victim of crime and therefore a victim of terrorism as well, that there are victims that have additional vulnerabilities. And these, in terms of access to justice, have to be taken into account. These include, but it's not an exhaustive list, includes child victims, so juvenile victims, which in the context of, of victims of terrorism is, is very important to take into account. It also includes victims of sexual and gender-based violence when committed by designated or uh, understood as terrorist groups. Who can be also recognized as victims. This is, you know, in, in, in uh, it's it's a situation that unfortunately happens too often. That uh, some women may may remain hidden for fear of reprisal or, uh, or stigmatization by the society, and when they are victims of, of these type of crimes, and in particular when they are perceived as being uh, uh, in relation to terrorist groups. Victims of trafficking as well in relation to uh, to terrorism, and as I was saying just in the beginning, cross border victims in the sense of foreign victims of terrorist acts committed on the territory of the state. Um, so these also have to be taken into account, and they have specific needs. Not that they have necessarily specific rights, but they do have apart from maybe some for the juvenile system for child victims, but they do have specific needs. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, explain uh, briefly um, how the UN has responded to the issue of victims of terrorism. And just to say that the, just like at the international level and with regards to victims generally of international crimes, victims of terrorism uh, have been recognized as slowly, in a slow process and a progressive process, even within the UN context. And so it's only since more or less 2006 with the UN Global Counter Terrorism Strategy 
that victims have started of terrorism have started to be mentioned. Now it's mentioned in the in the latest uh, CT strategy. Uh, victims are mentioned. This is the one from from July 2023. The special reporter on counterterrorism and, and human rights while countering terrorism has also been treating and taking some uh, a lot a lot of attention on victims of terrorism. There is always a section a section on, on victims' rights of terrorism in all the country visit reports. And there is a 2012 uh, principles on the human rights of victims of terrorism that is very interesting, the only one that exists that has been written by former special rapporteur Ben Emerson. Since then, there has been a, a more and more more and more attention given to the victims of terrorism. There's the 2017 establishment of the International Day of Remembrance and Tribute to the Victims of Terrorism, which is now a UN special day. And there has been, for the first time in 2020, a Secretary General report on the progress of the UN as a system in supporting member states to assist victims of terrorism. So as you see, this is relatively recent. In February 2022, there was the launch of a project on which I worked for many months, which is the UNOCT, UNODC, and an Interparliamentary Union Model Provisions on the Rights of Victims of Terrorism taking into account that indeed there is no such thing as a legal framework um, to, 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 to turn to uh, on the rights of victims of terrorism. So those model provisions are here to try to assist um, member states to uh, look into their legislation on the rights of victims of terrorism. Lastly, just last year, there was for the first time um, the biggest UN Congress on victims of terrorism. Um, with regards to the model legislative provisions, uh, they have been launched in last February uh, 2022. Again, they are just models against which national member states can look into their legislation. They are uh, provisions and they come with a commentary that includes uh, the legal sources and as well as good practice and implementation. So if some people here are listening and they're interested in looking at their legislation and seeing how this could adapt, it's, it's just a good, uh, it's an interesting way to look into domestic legislation with regards to the rights uh, of terrorism. Now, I just want to go through just very general and overarching principles of those provisions. And this is also a manner to explain how I, I understand victims of terrorism and their rights should be addressed. First of all, there is a victim-centric approach, meaning that it's, uh, it always needs to be taken from the victim's point of view. There's a human rights-based approach here, meaning that victims of terrorism and their rights should be framed within the general framework of international human rights law, of international humanitarian law, and refugee law when it applies. There's a general approach of non-hierarchy, and I think that is very important to state always, that there is no hierarchy between victims, that there is no hierarchy between a victim of war crime or a victim of terrorism. And sometimes we'll talk about it. There may be some, some that may be characterized from uh, different aspects. And then, of course, this general principle of do no harm, which does include the fact of preventing secondary victimization and re-traumatization from the justice system itself, because too often, the judicial system itself may um, may um, have some re-traumatization re -traumatization aspect to it without willing, of course, but it, it happens. So that is very important. In the MLPs, in the model provisions, you will find um, different rights that are being framed in different chapters. And these include the right to assistance, victims of terrorism, from the, the very from day from the first minute after the attack until as long as the victim needs it. The right to reparation, seen from the judicial point of view, but also from the state compensation point of view. The protection of the physical and psychological integrity and privacy of the victim, including with regards to the media, because with regards to victims of terrorism, that is a, a very important aspect. Access to justice as well as the right to information. And all that includes in a transversal way, the importance of including civil society organizations. 
Now I'll get to, to our topic today, which is access to justice, which obviously is fundamental for victims of crime. And of course it's fundamental for victims of terrorism. Because of the transnational dimension of terrorism, the idea of cooperation is also one that is very important, both in terms of access into justice, but also cooperating in the implementation and effectiveness of this access to justice. Now, there are two, two main questions that I would like to, to discuss with you uh, with regards to the right to access justice, um, which is a fundamental right. And it's one, the impact of the legal system, and two, the impact that it may have on the place of victims of the legal characterization. Now, with regards to the legal system, as we all know, there are two major systems in the world. There are others as well, but there are two main systems, civil law and common law. And with regards from the point of view of the victim and as lawyers, it's extremely different. It has paramount consequence on how the victims will be able to participate, whether we are in an adversarial system or in an inquisitorial system. So in a nutshell, in a common law system, the role of victims in the criminal procedure, and that's true for victims of terrorism, is generally limited to providing information as a witness, providing information in support of the prosecution. Victims have no formal legal status. They participate as witnesses. That means that they don't have legal representation. They cannot be legally represented. What we see, though, is a trend to more and more accept victims in the criminal proceeding, even in common law systems, through victim impact statements, which may actually have an impact on the sentencing stage. But it does not go to the extent of the civil law system, which, of course, is not always black and white like that, but it's more just to give um, a canvas. In a civil law system, victims are allowed to participate in criminal proceedings. That means that they can be up to um, have equal rights with the defense and the prosecution, be legally represented, and they can initiate criminal proceedings, and they will then have access to the case file. They can make requests for investigative action. They can request witnesses to be heard. They can request experts to be heard. They are recognized as parties in some system, in some, system, some countries. We call them civil parties or private complainants. It depends. So that's as, as, as big uh, the difference is between the two legal systems. So, of course, in terms of access to justice, this will be extremely important. Now, more specifically on victims of terrorism, there is an issue that I think is important, is the impact of legal characterization. We're, uh, the judicial response to terrorism from the state point of view, as we analyze the, the response, is very often to respond to terrorism through by charging the alleged perpetrators of crimes of membership or of crimes of preparation for terrorist acts, or if if you want to apply it to persons that come back from, um, for example, North East Syria, what people may call foreign terrorist fighters, for traveling or purpose, you know, have the purpose of terrorism or recruitment. Now, some in some countries, these membership crimes are being considered as victimless um, because they are membership rights. So it's, it's from the point of view of the alleged perpetrator. But the reality is that it's actually fundamental that victims um, have um, can are able to be in a court where the charges reflect the reality of the seriousness of the crimes that have been committed in relation to the terrorist attack. And that's where this whole discussion about cumulative charges, I'm sure a colleague from, from the Yazidi uh, uh, will talk about that, talk about that. So uh, it's very important to, to reflect that as well. Um, I will now turn to the French system and just apply what I just said to the French um, trials that just happened. Just to give you an order of, of importance, um, the of importance, the the 14th November 2015 trial lasted 10 months. There were 2,579 victims that participated as civil parties, and there were over 300, actually almost 400 lawyers that participated. Five full weeks of this trial was dealt only with listening to victims' testimonies, only. Up to between 12 and 18 testimonies per day were listened and heard by the defense and the court itself. 
In the knee terrorist attack, it's similar, similar kind of setting, except that it was a little bit shorter. In, in the French criminal setting, there, is, there are two main things, I think, to, to say um, that are very important. One is that in terms of reparation, it's a derogatory regime. I will get to that. And two, that there's been a number of good practice and lessons to learn from the French travels. These are pictures of um, the court hearing, the court that has been actually built for those trials. So there's a specialized court in France to hear terrorism cases. So that's uh, there was a specially built court. There was a special entrance for the civil party and for the victims, different from uh, the general public and different also from the media. A very high security and police presence, and also the fact that no one could enter without a badge. So there needs to be there was a registration process which could be a violation to publicity, but there was also a separate uh, room for the general public, which was often full, but still it was there. Um, in terms of effective access to justice, from a lawyer's perspective, what's really important is to know that in France, there is an automatic legal aid for all victims of terrorism. So victims of terrorism do not have to show their how much money or resources they have. It's automatically given legal aid to them. There's also um, some uh, transportation and the lodging costs that are being covered by the judicial system and a very small amount of per diem and um, a percentage of salary covered when they are when they decide to actually come to the hearing as civil parties. Um, another very interesting uh, lesson uh, from the, the French latest terrorism-related trial is the use of some protective measures, in particular with regards to the media. You see here the drawing, you see it's a civil, they are civil parties and they wear a red necklace with their badge. When they wear this red necklace, that means that they don't want to talk to the media. If they have, they have the same one with a green necklace, that means they are okay to talk to the media. And that has helped a lot in the interaction with the media. And they could change it, of course, in the same day. They could decide to talk to the media or not. But then the media would not even try to approach them if they didn't want to. And that's something I think it's interesting. It's easy and it worked pretty really well. With regards to psychological support, um, there were, as you can see here on the pictures, um, person psychologists that were all the time during the 10 months hearing and the four months hearing in the NIST trial there in order to support whomever needed support from a psychological point of view. Obviously, first ones that did are the civil parties, but I could just tell, say for practice that our translators did use the psychological support, and we did as well as lawyers. Uh, because hearing testimonies of victims for five, five weeks is, is not something that is easy for no one, including for professionals that are used to, to work in that in that setting. So that was also very interesting. Those psychologists could be called as well on the phone. Um, now I'll get to the reparation because I know I, I'm short of time. The reparation, just to, to say that here in France, we have a derogatory regime with regards to reparation. So it was decided that with regards to victims of terrorism, there would not be any reparation order given by the criminal judge that is done prior to the trial outside of criminal proceedings because there is a state compensation fund which is funded by our insurance contract in France. So we have a percentage of the insurance contract that goes into that fund, which is not only for victims of terrorism, but includes victims of terrorism. And so the compensation comes in distinctly from the from the trial. So one can ask what is the role of lawyers and victims if they appear in a trial where the compensation slash reparation has already been dealt with. This is something that most many lawyers and have been discussing during the trial, but I'll just give you the answer through the words of victims in a minute. I just wanted to say that with regards to the prejudice and the damages that were recognized in France, there are two uh, grounds of prejudice that have been recognized that are extremely interesting. 
specifically for victims of terrorism. One is the prejudice of waiting and worry. I'm not sure the translation is the best, but that's, I think you understand. And the second one is the prejudice of the anxiety of imminent death. These are two prejudices, two grounds of prejudice that have been recognized by the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court in the context of terrorist attacks to recognize that victims of terrorism have specific prejudice, therefore specific needs in terms of reparation. And finally, um, I wanted to, to just also state that in France, there are other reparation measures that also come from the state, and that just shows that the that terrorism is a special a uh, special crime with a, a very large amount taken into account by the state itself, which recognizes victims of terrorism as victims, civil victims of war. And they are being given the possibility of uh, having a national medal for the recognition as victims of terrorism. This has been discussed um, a lot by victim association, but it's something that's interesting, not only in France, but also in Spain and in, in, in Belgium. And finally, I wanted to um, um, tell you about the right information, the fact that um, those, um, those trials are trials that have an impact on the whole society because of the impact of the terrorist attack. And therefore, there has been a change, a fundamental change in the broadcast of trials in France with regard specifically to those two trials. There was a web radio, which is not at all common in France, that was provided for the civil party so that they could listen to the hearing from wherever they wanted with, with codes and, and passwords, et cetera. They could listen to the trial. So that web radio was very important and it was very well attended apparently for more or less 600 persons per day during the hearing. Unfortunately, one of the uh, down, downfall of that is that there was no interpretation of the web radio. So that's something that, that, is, that could be uh, better. Uh, this, of course, had a huge impact on the cross-border victim, the lack of translation of the web radio. The fact that the web radio could, was not accessible from abroad, it was accessible only in France. So that's also something, as lawyer, that we denounced a lot and we tried to change without any success. And finally, I just want to leave that screen to let you just read maybe a few of the abstracts of what the victims themselves said during the audition uh, in the 14th of November 2015 attacks of what they what it meant for them to participate in the trial, even though, again, the reparation stage was outside uh, of the judicial proceeding. Uh, so I'll just let, put that on the screen, and um, and I think I will stop there because I've been too long already. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, for this uh, presentation, for presenting the model legislative provision, uh, the difference between common and civil law uh, trials, the French trials, the lessons learned, uh, a lot uh, of food for thoughts and for questions at uh, the end of all the presentation. So without losing more time, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Catherine, and we'll continue with questions at the end of all the presentations. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about um, the ways in which the AAAM is able to assist uh, victims or survivors of uh, terrorism cases um, access to justice. And of course, uh, in order to do that in context, I just want to recall a, a little bit of the context of um, the creation of the AAAM, we were uh, established in a context where um, the Security Council was blocked and um, the use of vetoes by China and, and Russia prevented the referral of the Syrian situation, if you wish, as a, as a block to the International Criminal Court. We were also uh, established in a context where there was massive documentation of uh, a number of core international crimes, uh, at least allegations of such crimes occurring in the context of the Syrian situation, including unlawful attacks, uh, including detention related crimes, um, with torture and killing, both by state and non state actors. And in the case of non state actors, this included terrorist groups. Uh, such as ISIL, but others as well. And um, in these 
instances, we were um, faced with allegations of abductions, trafficking, slavery, killings, a number of the of the conduct that uh, Jeanne uh, referred to, as well as the use uh, of children in hostilities um, and their conscription, enlistment, etc. So our mandate uh, is not limited to uh, support victims of uh, conduct by members of terrorist groups. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, at the scale of the Syrian situation itself. We, uh, in a nutshell, are collecting the information available, we are preserving it, we're consolidating it, analyzing it, building a case file, but also sharing the information and the analytical work we do with competent jurisdiction. And uh, we are best described, I think we could say, as a justice facilitator, uh, which means that it shapes the ways in which we can support access for to victims to, to, to justice, in fact. We are uh, intervening during the investigations of uh, the national actors, uh, but we're also building cases for the future. And um, I think uh, it's fair to maybe add one, one dimension to the work we're doing, uh, which will uh, enable you to understand how concretely our victim survivor centered approach is materializing. Um, in order to support the ongoing investigation by competent jurisdiction, of course, we receive requests from them and we uh, share the information that we have that could be of support to their case. But that's not uh, limited to that. I will enter into some, some additional details later. Another way we can uh, support access to justice is by the cases that we build ourselves, by the structural investigation we conduct, uh, in which we focus and dive into specific aspects of the Syrian situation. And we have currently three such lines of inquiry, if you wish, one of which is related to crimes attributed to members of the group uh, ISIL. So terrorism cases are within the mandate of the mechanism, but we are not uh, meant to support uh, mere uh, charges of um, uh, investigation that merely look at membership membership in a terrorist organization. What we can, can do is support investigation that also look into uh, uh, crime against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. And that's really a very important aspect, just building on what Jean said earlier, we're of course faced with situations where um, in focusing on those charges, it's possible for victims to see what really happened to them reflected in the cases. So we can uh, help prosecutors if they're at least investigating those core international crimes, um, and we wouldn't be able to help them if the scope of their investigation is from the outset limited to uh, purely uh, terrorist uh, offenses. So I think the best way I can explain uh, the, the, the ways we uh, assist uh, access of uh, victims to, to, to justice is by giving you an idea of the amount of requests for, for assistance that we receive that concern uh, cases involving terrorist group. Out of the 298 requests for assistance we've received to date, 143 concern uh, ISIL and um, 18 concern other groups, including uh, terror, terrorist groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra, for instance, and also other non-state actors um, uh, labeled as uh, Salafi jihadist armed groups, uh, which are not necessarily all um, listed as terrorist groups. Since uh, 2019, we've developed forms of assistance that go beyond the mere sharing of information that we have in our central repository. Uh, we are also sharing analytical products that we develop as part of our lines of inquiry. And I will uh, speak about two of them in a moment. And we also um, uh, tailor, we're being asked to tailor specific analytical products for the need of their cases. Uh, we are uh, geolocating uh, crime scenes and other uh, locations of interest. We're conducting open source research, and we uh, make sure that based, that uh, the national authorities are able to identify and locate witnesses 
for subsequent interviews by the uh, investigators, or we introduce with the consent of the sources, these national actors with the, source, with the sources, or we conduct interviews ourselves in support of their cases. So this would be in a way, the traditional way that I think we've been specifically mandated to, to support um, by supporting the national authorities indirectly was supporting victim and survivors. But we are very much conscious that there is a lot more than a mechanism like uh, ours can do. And we consider that engaging with victim and survivors of uh, atrocity crimes um, in the context of terrorism cases is uh, an important way of not directly um, providing them access to justice, but, but in a way, to uh, implement a, a rights-based approach. And uh, that is basically um, informing them of the work we do, informing them of the cases that uh, have managed to go to uh, a trial and to a verdict, giving them information, but to the limited extent that we can share with the consent of the national authorities, giving them information about things which are at the investigative stage that can be uh, talked about consult them about a certain aspect of our work. And uh, I will take here very briefly two examples. Uh, I mentioned the, the analytical work that we produce as part of our lines of inquiry. In the context of the ISIL line of inquiry, for instance, we have developed uh, a first brief that we've shared now with eight different jurisdictions and that has been used um, directly plugged into some of the cases and otherwise used by the prosecutor to build their own cases. We decided to focus that first brief and the underlying evidence on uh, demonstrating the existence of a systematic attack by the group uh, ISIL against the civilian population and to show, uh, although that's not a requirement of that element of a crime against humanity, to show the discriminatory nature of such attacks. And um, that is focusing on the various communities that have been directly targeted by uh, Daesh, including Yazidi, but including uh, Sunni Muslim, including Shia Muslim, including um, uh, people targeted on the basis of their uh, sexual uh, orientation or on the basis of their gender or their age. And we are in this brief looking at the specific treatment of these different groups and we framed it in a way which can be uh, used by prosecutors to demonstrate this element of uh, a crime against humanity and then to add the relevant conduct of the suspect they are uh, looking into. We have now, uh, we have decided that it was very important to share that information and the content of that, uh, that work with victims of uh, ISIL. And we are uh, also going to, well, we have actually uh, done that in the past, but also having a consultation that is starting this week with uh, different communities represented that have been victims of crimes attributed to, to uh, ISIL. And we will share with them not only this work, which is done, explain how it's being used, uh, their information that we can share about the, uh, the type of request of assistance that we receive and what uh, requests we've been able to support uh, out of the 200 uh, uh, requests that we've been able to assist, 206 requests we've been able to assist since the start of our work. And we're also going to share um, uh, a project on which uh, this line of inquiry is now focusing, which is related to um, what we call the Cubs of the Caliphate, what, what was called the, the, the Cubs of the Caliphate, which examines ISIL, ISIL practice of conscription, enlistment of children, as well as their training and use in, in hostilities. So by sharing that with, with you, and I will end with that, uh, I think it's a way for us to make sure that we are not considering victim survivors as external, uh, uh, you know, second thought type of uh, uh, stakeholders for us, they are the main stakeholders. I'll give you uh, just a word about the fact that when we were developing our first strategic plan for 2023 and 25, we uh, were looking at uh, developing our vision statement. And we could have absolutely uh, made it surround uh, the, the satisfaction of the competent jurisdiction we are supporting. 
this could have been our uh, vision statement. But in fact, it was very important for us to uh, reach a stage by which by the end of 2025, the Triple M will be recognized by victim and survivors of core international crimes committed in Syria uh, uh, as a crucial entity supporting and promoting current and future accountability efforts. And this is uh, a way I think to, to tell you how we uh, value it's not just words, we, we're doing it in practice. We value the input and, and, uh, of the victim and survivors and we care about uh, engaging with them in a two-way uh, two way work. And we're doing that by um, reinforcing and diversifying our engagement with them. We are doing that by incorporating their insight into our work, understanding their priorities and the barriers they face in accessing justice and trying to uh, to alleviate some of them. And we are, uh, of course, considering them as um, the, the, the primary uh, source of our, the primary beneficiaries of our, our work. I thank you. Hope I wasn't too long. Thank you very much, Katrine. And thank you for uh, telling us about the role of the mechanism and, so, and also how important it is uh, for you, uh, the victims and survivors, and how you can incorporate their opinion and uh, experiences uh, within your work. Uh, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Hope so that she can give us also the perspective of the victims. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah, OK, perfect. I still have this open. OK. Um, Thank you, uh, Nikki, and also to the ICCT for the, for the kind invitation. Um, also, thanks to Jean and Catherine for laying out the legal framework and institutional framework of access to justice for victims of uh, terrorism. Um, today, I would like to personally share with everybody my experience working with communities affected by terrorism. And doing this, I will shortly explain what the New Hanovich Foundation and what the Yazidi Legal Network do in general. And after that, I will go into the perspective of survivors and a victim or survivor-centric approach for the Yazidi community. Um, something we obviously, as a small organization, do our utmost best to pursue and respect. Um, so I'll share some key lessons learned and recommendations advocating for a more comprehensive and survivor-centered approach to justice. So first, a little bit about um, the Nuhanovich Foundation. I also shared um, a link on, uh, on, the, um, on the presentation if you'd like to see more. But the Nuhanovich Foundation was established in the Netherlands in 2011 by Professor Lisbeth Segfeld, together with a team of leading litigators and specialists in the field of accountability and remedies for violations of international and international humanitarian law. And along the years, we have very much developed a country programs and a network and supported criminal and civil litigations before Dutch courts. My role ha since 2015 has really been in supporting cases for the Syrian community and also cases related to Iraq. Um, we contribute to efforts of survivors of war to obtain justice, accountability and reparations for the harms they suffered during armed, armed cloth conflict during different ways. And this sometimes could be, I think also like Jean mentioned, um, you know, access to the courts, translations, uh, financial support, legal representation, advocacy, um, but we also facilitate physical access to the courts, not only um, online access. Um, sometimes this means just covering travel expenses. It can be very easy, but it sometimes can also be difficult with having victims across the world. Um, along the road, we really saw the need of not only supporting the direct survivors and witnesses, but also the broader community um, in their search for justice and accountability. And this is actually where our legal networks were born. So we developed Syria Legal Network, Yazidi Legal Network, and even recently we have started a Ukraine Legal Network. And these networks, they really take a holistic approach towards supporting affected communities and direct survivors and witnesses. Um, like Nikki said, for the purpose of today's topic, I'd like to focus on um, the Yazidis, which brings me to Yazidi Legal Network. Otherwise, I might refer them to or us as uh, YLN. First, I'd like to share a little bit about the specific situation of the Yazidis. I'm sure that everybody here knows about them. 
but um, just a little bit of background information would be good, I think. On August the 3rd in 2014, ISIS, the terrorist organization, invaded the Yazidis' homeland in Sinjar and began a campaign of mass violence. Up until today, roughly 10,000 Yazidis have been killed, enslaved, and the community has been totally devastated. Around 200,000 Yazidis are still internally displaced and across Iraq and northern Kurdistan region and the rest of the world, more than two and a half two and a half thousand women and children still remain in ISIS captivity. The crimes committed by ISIS have been recognized by the UN uh, Independent Commission of Inquiry for Syria as constituting the crime of genocide um, in line with the Genocide Convention, as well as crimes against humanity and war crimes uh, as in the ICC Rome Statute. I guess the current situation is not much more hopeful. In the almost 10 years since the genocide, efforts aimed at directly providing justice to Yazidi survivors has been scarce. It's estimated um, that 120 Yazidis have sought asylum in Europe and that approximately already two and a half thousand ISIS members have returned to their homeland. So back to the Yazidi legal network, um, we are a community of Yazidis, I'm not, <laughs> but um, we are also a diverse group of lawyers, law students, human rights activists, all united by our commitment to pursue justice, accountability, and the protection of Yazidi rights. Our aim really is to empower and support the Yazidis in their struggle to access justice for the crimes committed by ISIS in 2014, but also after that. We support the community and whatever their needs are at the moment. So not only from then and the genocide, but again, taking the holistic approach towards what they need. Uh, we were established in 2019 by the Nuanovich Foundation in response to the request of a group of survivors that are based in the Netherlands to assist them in their search for justice. Now, I think we all know and understand that the concept of justice and accountability means different things for everybody. But what we strive to achieve is to include these different concepts in every step of our work. Nevertheless, when we started YLN, we were very much focused on being a bridge between the community and national and international justice mechanisms. For instance, the Dutch War Crimes Unit, um, also Catherine, the Trip IM, we shared a lot of information with you um, and uh, similar to UNITALS. We acknowledge that this is not the main focus, even though in the aftermath of, 2014, of the 2014 genocide, the discussions, the general public discussions regarding justice have focused mainly on the prosecution of foreign terrorist fighters in Europe and the situation of the Yazidis in Iraq. But when we as an organization, but what we as an organization have seen is that these perspectives are not exactly only what the community see and what justice actually looks like for them. So one thing that mainly has been a priority for the bigger community is recognition of what happened. It is the start of justice for the community, but also by acknowledging what happened, it is the start of some sort of healing. So for that reason, uh, the YLN team lobbied the Dutch government to recognize the genocide formally, which we actually successfully did. And in 2001, the Dutch government formally recognized the crimes against the Yazidi as a genocide. Up to date, I think a few country, European countries have officially recognized the genocide, including several bodies of the UN, the European Parliament, um, National Assembly of Armenia, Australian Parliament, British Parliament, uh, Canadian Parliament, and the United States House of Representatives. Although unclear what these recognitions formally or legally mean, it is very much a symbolic sign of support uh, welcomed by the community. Um, so maybe a little bit about the prosecutions, what has been done up until now for the Yazidis. Um, one of the hallmark conviction is a Yazidi case in the in Germany against an ISIS member and Iraqi national Taha Ajay. He got a lifelong imprisonment under the charges of genocide. The next one was in 2022, where a returnee, Jalda'a, who was convicted by the Higher Regional Court of Hamburg um, for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aiding and abetting genocide through the abuse of Yazidi women. This case was the second ever verdict regarding the Yazidi genocide, um, reached under the principle of universal jurisdiction. 
More recently, there's also been a case against Nadine K, also in uh, Germany in Koblenz, um, and ending in a charge of genocide also by the German courts. So seeing Germany is a bit of a trailblazer, they've also convicted five additional ISIS members of crimes against humanity and war crimes for their involvement in crimes against the Yazidis. These were cases on uh, Jennifer W, Sarah O, Norton J, Omaima A, and Romina S. Um, more importantly for us, obviously, is a current case in the Netherlands, which is pending against an ISIS member, Hosna A, for slavery and terrorism offenses. Um, and like Jana mentioned, the whole perspective of cumulative charges is very important here in seeing actually not only you know, what are the terrorism offenses, but what factually happened on the ground, what um, contribution did this individual have in the crimes against the Yazidi. Um, over the years, sexual and gender-based violence committed as a tactic by uh, terrorists have also taken various forms, um, forced recruitment, rape, forced marriages, pregnancy, abortion, uh, sexual slavery. Um, so one of our biggest recommendations also to the Dutch government uh, and Dutch courts, and I guess other courts and um, investigative bodies uh, on the Yazidi crimes is really to take these offenses into consideration when prosecuting and invest investigating the crimes against the Yazidis. Um, so these criminal proceedings are really embedded in a broader ongoing debate in Europe. Generally, the question of accountability of ISIS fighters focusing among others on cumulative charges, so charging them with terrorist offenses and international crime offenses. Um, another part of the debate is the repatriation that kind of coincides with this debate of ISIS members with European citizenship. And what we see actually here is missing in a more survivor-centered discussion is what justice looks like if it were defined by the community and victims themselves. So one clear voice that we hear from the community is that the sentencing of the ISIS members is way too low for the crimes and the genocide committed against uh, the Yazidis. So mainly due to the fact that we do understand that, but mainly due to the fact that linkage evidence is difficult for the investigations and prosecution bodies to acquire. But regardless, we think that if they were in, more in touch with the Yazidis um, or, you know, not the strong voice we hear is that these individuals are or were a part of the genocidal organization. So what does that look like to have that conversation with, um, let's say, the war crime, crimes units? And I think that this needs to be taken into account in these cases. Um, furthermore, a big issue in repatriating the ISIS members is that survivors might run into their perpetrators at a grocery store. Um, you know, the Netherlands specifically taking that as an example is very small. I've um, we've seen here in the Netherlands that these situations uh, do occur, which is, I mean, obviously from a security perspective and from re-traumatization perspective, a very big issue. Um, again, I think that these conversations and discussions are unfortunately not taking place, even though it really is in the best interest of the countries to listen to the communities concerns and taking into account state security issues as well. Um, I think that other pressing challenges for the Yazidis that they face is social insecurities, as well as different forms of discriminations and raci racism. And this is not only in the region they're from, but this is also something that they face every day here in Europe. Uh, so I, I think that this is also a conversation that is not taking into being taken into consideration. Um, even if you look at like the asylum applications, a lot of the current asylum applications of Yazidis are being turned down, uh, justified by, you know, the understanding or the um, assumption that Iraq and Kurdistan are safe for them. So governments and immigration services, obviously do, they do apply different definitions of safety, but I think that they're also ignoring the everyday insecurities that Yazidis face um, and the, that the fact that they are a prosecuted minority group and uh, that they should be given priority. Um, one thing that we also see as an organization is that there is a disconnect between the needs of the community and the support of the government. So very general comments, 
But I think also here more discussions should be facilitated between, for instance, National War Crimes Unit again, but also policymakers and, of course, the Yazidi community itself in order to reach uh, a meaningful survivor-centered approach towards their needs and the concept of justice. Uh, this is uh, also the reason why we are organizing a three-day conference in January 2024 for specifically Yazidi survivors, um, justice actors in general, mental health practitioners, policymakers, and NGOs working on the Yazidi comms. Uh, we really aim here to facilitate a platform the Yazidis to share their view on the way forward. So not only focusing on accountability and the crimes committed in 2014, but the actual current needs of the community and how we can support and facilitate um, the way forward. Um, I think that a few of the agenda points are physical security, the Yazidis that are still missing. As I mentioned, there are still just under 3000 Yazidi women and children missing. So this is a big topic and the ongoing discrimination against the Yazidi across the world. The reconstruction of their homeland Sinjar, which um, still, still hasn't, um, progress hasn't been made there and uh, the status in refugee camps and much more. So the survivor center approach is having them themselves have a seat at the table, setting their own agenda and their own narrative, not only seeing them as being essential, also like Catherine said, um, to prosecutions, but truly supporting them and empowering them in regaining back the lives they once had. Um, I also shared the website of Yazidi Legal Network. You can see there also the work that we do. Um, we make sure that we have different platforms to facilitate their voice. We have a podcast, we have a blog. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously we also have the conference uh, coming up. So please, uh, please take a look at that. And if, um, if you're interested in any of the work that we have, I mean, please uh, contact me. And maybe one last note on the conference is we really aim to develop a working document and a call for action for those participating and working on the UZD, UZD cause. Um, so it's not just uh, having a round table and discussing what needs to be done. Uh, I guess this fight is far from finished, um, but I also see that my time is up. So I will end with this and uh, welcome questions. Thank you very much, Hope, and thank you to all the three of you. Uh, questions uh, have been starting coming. Uh, please feel free to submit any question you have in the Q&A session. Um, maybe we can start uh, by a question that you pose hope for Zan. Um, so Zan, uh, Hope was uh, wondering whether witnesses also have the right to legal aid within uh, the system. No, so witnesses do not have a right to legal aid and witnesses do not have procedural rights uh, as victims that decide to, to uh, participate as civil parties. So witnesses will swear oath, they will swear to tell the truth, they will not participate in the trial, they actually have to abide by, by being influenced by any and they have to remain outside of, of this and they will not be able to be a uh, actually, it's, it's, it's very um, um, complicated uh, for witnesses that are victims. Um, they have also to uh, remain as uh, outside of the judicial proceedings as possible and, and, and arrive uh, to explain and to tell their story without preparation by any lawyer. Thank you, Jean, for this uh, answer. And uh, maybe I will start uh, uh, posing some questions that we have in the Q&A. Uh, first, we have a question from Alisa concerning the reparation for victims. Uh, do they extend beyond the trial? Well, I, I think we may uh, have to talk a little bit more about reparation, which comes always after the trial. But maybe also this is linked a little bit uh, with uh, legal aid during the trial. Um, well, France, is, France is a very specific situation where there is this derogation, uh, derogatory regime, which is not the case for ordinary crimes and for international crimes. So you have uh, trials that have been happening in regards to Rwanda and Liberia for international crimes. The reparation order is, is granted by the criminal judge. 
only for terrorism, only for terrorism by this specialized court does the reparation uh, is is uh, uh, the, the the judge will have to decide on the admissibility of the civil party. So whether or not the civil party, the victim's prejudice is linked to the charges and is linked to uh, the final decision against the accused. So it, the judge will decide on the admissibility, but this will have no or little impact on the reparation, given that the criminal judge in France in terrorism trials is not in charge anymore since a couple of years, to decide on the reparation order, which is being settled prior through this Fond Garantie, Fond Garantie, FGTI, with a state compensation fund. But what is interesting in France is that since 2019, we have a specific judge for the issues of reparation in relation to terrorism. So if there is any appeal of this state compensation fund, Victims can go for the the GIVAT, It's called the Juge de l'Indemnisation des Victimes de Terrorisme. So victims of terrorism uh, judge specifically to look at into the appeal. Or in the case that a victims uh, decide to become a civil party on the first day of the hearing, which is a possibility, so has not been participating prior during the investigation stage, then the 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 victim can go. To that judge. So, in short answer is the reparation is being dealt outside most of the time before the trial, and it, and so the compensation itself does not last after. But of course, the other type of, of reparation measure, such as satisfaction or measures of non-repetition, like you know, the medal or memorialization measures, the establishment of a, of a museum or curriculum in school. Of course, these type of measures, they, they stay, you know, the temporality is different. I hope I, I was clear because France is really specific. Yeah, that's what I did. So, yeah. <laughs> because generally reparation comes after the trial when you have uh, the responsibility established and also you have the final conviction. So yeah, I do understand that French system is different, but of course there are measures like satisfaction that they last uh, after the trial, as it's like memorials and like the metal that you say, etc. cetera. Uh, I had also a question for uh, Catherine uh, concerning, uh, you talk about the consultation that you're gonna have uh, with the victims, how these consultations are organized? So this consultation, uh, which I, I situate as part of our victim uh, survivor centered approach, are specific uh, instances where we identify um, uh, a number of communities and uh, associations representative of uh, victims of crimes in these communities, which are, so far this is the way we've done it, which are particularly uh, concerned by the work we do in one or another line of inquiry. So when it comes to uh, crimes attributed to ISIL, uh, this is what we do. We bring together a number of those participants. We um, have a, an, an important part of our team that is directly working on developing this work, uh, this analytical work that I mentioned, um, particularly when it comes to work that is still in the making for which it's, uh, possible to get feedback from, from uh, and, and to get perspective from the victims uh, incorporated. We uh, are also sharing with them the uh, type of work that we do in direct support of national jurisdiction, uh, since at this moment for this crime, these are our interlocutors. And uh, we basically uh, make sure that we can uh, capture their views I mentioned the barriers they face to access justice, but also um, all sorts of um, perspective they have on the work we do. Are we focusing on the right uh, elements? Uh, uh, and in cases where um, we do uh, face um, uh, difficulties accessing uh, elements or evidence that is particularly relevant to uh, the work that we do, we have another form of engagement which is in fact a workshop, this time with uh, um, CSOs that are directly documenting these crimes. And we, again, um, 
look at uh, sharing with them where we stand in the development of our project and seeking to uh, get uh, them to help filling the gaps as we as we see them. But we also have another platform of engagement, which is um, not following necessarily uh, the focus of one of our line of inquiry, and which is a more um, regular um, platform of engagement, uh, which permits to uh, to have a representative of different communities, in fact, and, and CSOs. So it's in person, just to go back to your question, in person, um, the identification of participants when it comes to the consultation is uh, made by us and by our colleagues uh, engaging with uh, victim uh, survivor communities representatives so that we uh, try to make sure that we are around the table uh, person that are directly concerned and that uh, may indeed uh, Thank you, Guy. To the reflection on, on those matters. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, there is Susan that she shared uh, her story on the QA. Uh, it's, I'm not going to read it because I think everyone can read it. So if you want to uh, comment on this, please feel free. And we have uh, three questions by Graham. Uh, the first one concerns it's, it's the following. Uh, Germany and the Netherlands both have absolute jurisdiction over the citizens, but have the capacity to adapt their legal system to other jurisdictions to try their citizens under the laws of another. Is this option being looked into elsewhere to resolve the issues of jurisdiction? Maybe some of you, like Jean, Hope, Catherine, you have, uh, um, you want to respond to this question? Happy to give it a try, but I just want to make sure I understand Graham's point about um, the adaptation of the legal system to other jurisdictions. Um, I'm not an, entirely sure I understand what he has in mind there. We we do have um, um, different jurisdictions which are uh, constituting joint investigative teams, for instance. That's uh, the case currently. Um, in, involving Germany and France on crimes, uh, but, but uh, these are crimes um, attributed uh, to uh, the regime in Syria. But we also have another joint investigative team, which is basically uh, gathering uh, Sweden, France, and, um, and Belgium. And this is directly related to crimes committed in Syria um, uh, by members of uh, ISIL. But I'm not sure I understand the issue about the uh, the adjustment of uh, of the legislation to accommodate. Uh, let me just go back. To yeah, I think maybe Graham can uh, uh, specify that in yeah. the chat or in the Q and A because it's indeed uh, a little bit uh, uh, not unclear. Uh, maybe in the meanwhile, a question about uh, for hope. Um, I was wondering what are the other, like uh, you talked about how victims uh, look justice, what is justice for them and for the community. Uh, are they thinking about other uh, initiatives like, uh, you know, in the context of transitional justice that we have truth commissions and are they have, uh, like you are in contact with them, have they talked about this kind of initiatives? Um, thanks, Nikki, for the question. I think that um, the, the community itself has not necessarily talked about truth commissions. Um, one debate that is very big within the community, within the Yazidi community uh, right now is, um, which also I think refers to maybe one of the uh, questions in the, uh, uh, in the chats, is uh, to have a tribunal or some so sort of mechanism in the future on, uh, on the Yazidi specifically. Um, to be honest, it's it's very fragmented. Um, some of the Yazidis say that they would rather have um, the ISIS members, for instance, be repatriated by European governments because they know that they then will be uh, prosecuted um, because the uncertainty of a potential tribunal or mechanism is very large and having um, these ISIS members in the uh, in the camps in the region is is also a big security risk. If you just think about, 
you know, it potentially the 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 prison's potentially breaking. Um, the you know, even if you talk to the war crime different war crimes units or intelligence agencies, I think that their biggest concern is also this is not having control of the situation. So, again, I think that um, the debate is very large. Uh, they understand that you know prosecution in the region at the moment is not really possible, um, but they do. Um, they do, do like to see that happening because they also say that the charges and the um, uh, the uh, d the charges will be much higher than here in Europe. So it it kind of goes back and forth there. Thank you, Hope. And I'm going back to the questions from the public. Uh, there is a question about uh, children under 18 or 16 years old who are committing terrorist acts and how they have been treated, whether they are victims or terrorists. Maybe, Jean, you can uh, explain a little bit about that. It really depends on the jurisdiction. It's difficult to answer. Um, it, it really does France. depend. Maybe I can I can answer also some some of the. I mean, more generally, there is you know of course it's it's extremely important that that uh, that um, justice for minors such as now justice is being applied uh, in the best possible way, and of course they're um, you know under uh, after the age of fifteen or sixteen, depending on the on the country. Uh, some some individuals that are under 18, depending on the age of majority, or being uh, treated as, as adults, um, these may raise some, some very serious issues. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to, I think, to answer generally more broadly. Uh, there was a question, do you mind? I, I think there was a question interesting with regards to whether or not some... Uh, sorry, I, I lost it. Yeah, please, if you... So I'll just... Um, some whether or not some um, persons that were coming back from northeast Syria, uh, women, I think in particular, I think it was in the, in the question, yeah. were considered as victims, yes, former combatants or group supporters treated as victims in France or in the Netherlands. I don't know about the Netherlands, but I can tell you that in France, there's been attempts to have um, victims, some women uh, cases of women uh, coming back former combatants or who have traveled uh, to be recognized as victims and it was never recognized. So the prosecutorial strategy is is, is relatively uh, repressive and not very open to, to that, in particular since 2013. Actually, there was a very clear cut. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, I think this question went to the answered because you answered something, so I was also uh, searching for that. And uh, Graham has uh, added some comment concerning uh, what he meant by adapting. Uh, he said, uh, Germany, Netherlands are able to adapt to the laws of another country to try a Dutch or German national under a third country's legal system that is in the Lockerbie trial in The Hague. The Dutch court was able to uh, to use Scottish law to find Libya guilty of the Lockerbie attack. But I have the impression that this was a particular case. It's not what is can be uh, every day. Yeah, it was quite particular. And I'm not aware that this option is currently being looked into in relation to the, the cases that we are uh, supporting. At least not as we, as we speak. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, I think Graham, you have to search online about this specific case because uh, there were, uh, I think, some agreements between the countries in order to create the competence of the court yeah. to. But I, I understand now. This is what what uh, Graham means by adapting. Yeah. Uh, there is a question about Africa and uh, how. Uh, so... How do you think victims of ADF terrorist groups in Congo and Uganda may benefit international framework as well as uh, different support for their access to justice? I think this has to do with uh, the jurisdiction of every state and the possibility that every state has to uh, give the possibility to, ju to access justice to victims. I don't know if you have to share some thoughts on this. 
Popper, John, Katrina. If not, um, well, I mean, it, but what, what are we talking about by by talking about um, these victims being able to benefit from from the international framework? Are we talking about the UN rules, for instance, that Jan uh, articulated, or are we talking about the possibility of these victims being uh, seeing accessing trials in in the uh, competent courts of, um, you know, for instance, European courts uh, exercising universal jurisdiction. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I think this, the answer to, is different. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, the the, the question is really broad for us to be able to give a specific question on this: how victims can access justice. The, the UN rules that uh, the UN frameworks that Jean articulated are applying. Uh, to all victims of, uh, of terrorism. They are not uh, specifically for a particular uh, legal context. When it comes to competence, uh, extraterritorial competence in Europe, well, that again depends on the country. I mean, some have uh, pure forms of universal jurisdiction as in Germany, others have more restricted forms um, and, and still require some kind of a link. Uh, often it will depend on the possibility on, on the the fact that you have communities representative from uh, this situation on the soil of uh, uh, the territorial state, because even if even in Germany, where in principle uh, universal jurisdiction applies, the prosecutors would act if there is at least some connection to 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 Germany, and and these requirements are even stronger in some other countries. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot. There are some other questions. One that it's about the most common charges brought against the alleged terrorist. If there are uh, crimes under universal jurisdiction, uh, or if there is uh, like national, I mean, if there are international crimes or national offenses, most often. I, I think I can very short. Oh, sorry, Jean. <laughs> Uh, did you? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, very just very short for the Netherlands because um, obviously this is something that we as an organization are are pushing for again the the cumulative charges, but mainly for the um, returnees um, have been terrorism charges under normal Dutch law. Um, the international crimes that have been charged for the returnees are twofold. The two cases. So one is the Yazidi case. That's the Hasna A case for slavery. Um, in addition to the terrorism offenses. But then uh, there's another case pending, which is a pillaging case under international crimes in addition to terrorism uh, offenses. So it's not that much, but we're uh, we're trying, we're doing our best. If I, if I may add, um, there are sometimes um, uh, jurisdictional challenges, uh, taking for instance, the example of uh, Sweden, where um, Crime against humanity can only be prosecuted uh, uh, after, um, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking 2015, uh, the, I hope I'm correct, meaning that there are a number of cases uh, concerning crimes committed in Syria by uh, terrorist groups that couldn't be charged as crime against humanity, but uh, uh, the prosecutors are then applying other offenses for which such a jurisdiction, such a limitation doesn't exist. And just to give you an example, uh, recently uh, this year in Solna in, in Sweden, a court convicted uh, the mother of two uh, girls and um, her partner who had both joined uh, ISIL in Syria uh, for, um, um, for the repeated rape committed uh, against uh, the girls and forced marriage. Uh, imposed. So other type of offenses and crime against humanity, for instance, have been used and, and really capture the, the, the totality of the conduct uh, at stake. Uh, this is a situation where uh, we were able to assist when I, when I was referring to being asked to tailor specific um, work for the needs of the case. 
uh, we were able to, in, in this case, to, to support was demonstrating the, the specific treatment of women and, and girls by uh, uh, ISO. But uh, also an area where I think it's, it's becoming really interesting, we see that some prosecutors would, who would in principle uh, rather go straight for um, charging membership in a terrorist organization because it's obviously easier, uh, are willing to uh, explore the possibility of community charges. And uh, we've, we've been told on uh, several occasions that with the support that we provided uh, in relation to these core international crimes, they were able to uh, ac actually include core international crimes in, in the charges, which wasn't necessarily a, a given at the beginning. So again, a mix of uh, of uh, approaches, a lot of uh, creativity in this respect within the remit of the law. Maybe Jean, you have to add something. Yes, if I may just um, add to what Catherine and, and Hope were saying. I think I would just want to uh, to highlight and commend the work of uh, victims' organizations and civil society organizations that bring to the attention of the prosecutor's office uh, the need to reflect those international crimes charges because as, as Catherine was saying, the, the prosecutorial strategy in most cases is, is really to go to the to the quickest and the simple uh, way, which is membership. And, and that is explainable. I mean, that can be understood with regards to evidence. It's definitely not, um, not the same type of investigation with regards to evidence when looking at, at core international crimes or membership. Uh, but I think in the, in the 14th November 2015 trial, there was, that's very personal, but I, I had a perception that the legal charges, which were charges of membership, uh, and the reality of what the victims faced, there was almost like a, a discontinued conversation, as if really it, it, it didn't fit. I mean, it worked somehow because from the words of the victims, they it achieved something. But at the same time, there was a dichotomy, something that didn't work between the charges, what the charges reflected, and and the reality of what the victims suffered. And and I think that's that's really that's really interesting from like a German perspective. I was talking to a lawyer regarding the Berlin attack. And she was in the Berlin market attack. She was telling me that there had been no trial because it was considered a victim less. That's why I wanted to highlight that crime because because the the alleged perpetrator the perpetrator was was killed. Uh, and so yeah, I think this whole issue of legal, legal characterization has, does have an impact on on victims, and um, it's most of the time it's victims themselves that bring it up. And victims associations. Exactly, and the ICCT has been working with uh, interlinkages between uh, international crimes and terrorist offenses. So soon we're gonna uh, have an event on cumulative charges, uh, and you can see on our website we're gonna uh, have some uh, news on this uh, topic. Uh, there is a very last question. Oh, maybe hope you want to. Yeah. No, I was else. just. I was just thinking after I heard uh, Catherine and Jean uh, talk about um, about this uh, this topic is just to clarify I was talking about the the returnees so the Dutch nationals um, we have had other international crimes uh, and terrorism uh, cases before Dutch courts um, a few of them mainly concerning the Syrian conflict um, but just to just to clarify that sorry yeah thank you. Um... Maybe a very last question, and really uh, quickly, uh, what are the main differences between the jurisdiction of victims of terrorism and war refugees? Is the status of one harder to get than the other? Well, some reflections on this? I think it's also depend on the crime, so uh, on the country as well. I mean, yeah. the legislation is going to differ from state to state, and um, yeah. 
quite uh, large uh, questions. Uh, if we have a specific uh, example, it would have been more easy maybe to say why uh, they have been uh, uh, selected the one and not the other. Uh, and with that, I think we almost answer all the questions. And I would like to thank you for being here uh, with us, for having accepted the invitation in the first place. And I would like to uh, thank uh, the participants for joining us for their questions. And of course, thank the communication team of the ICCT that is behind the organization of this event. And a kind reminder to improve uh, the, our future events by completing the very short uh, post-event survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of this webinar. So uh, thank you uh, for my part. I really enjoy our conversation. I hope you do uh, did as well. And uh, I will be happy to see you again soon. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you.